I don't know why, people in Malaysia, they seem to think that it's a good idea to learn how to control your car in Genting rather than Sepang. Hi, I'm Alif Hamdan, I'm 29 years old, and cars are an important part of my life. There's some really tight racing. Now Alif's going to make his attack, but again, beautiful drive from Kipi, and he tries to cut off the inside, but this time, Alif may have done it. Owning a garage is always something that I've wanted, because I love the idea of taking something and engineering it to make it better or more personalized. Uh, we do my nephew's Kalisa, we do Saga 1.5 carburetors, we do CCC3, we have a few Porsche 718s. We don't really discriminate as long as the need for more is there, we're always around to just give a helping hand. Um, I really love uh, what I do every day. It's what drives me out of bed every morning. Um, this is my profession, and I really, really enjoy it. I first started racing, first dabble into motorsports was, I guess, at the age of nine, back in Ipoh. My cousin owned a go-kart circuit. At the time, it's called River Kart Circuit, RKC. So back then, at nine, I used to be able to, like, dice with people who drive, like, you know, who ride super bikes at the age of 30, 40, and I'm just like, some really, really overweight nine-year-old that's doing not bad on a go-kart, so that sort of, led me to believe that you know, I, I have somewhat of an ability to drive. Yeah. I was 19, turning 20 maybe. We went to a thing called Evolution Nationals. So that was my first ever competition. I had no expectation, man. Just went in there after doing many, many driver defense days and driver coaching. So I just thought I'd try my luck at a local competition. I think I came second outright. So it was like a big hoo-ha in the Evo community back then some overweight 19-year-old Asian kid just turned up and was second in the class and no one heard of me before that. I had no experience, no go-kart, apart from when I was nine to 10, you know, back in Ipoh. But yeah, that was the first taste, I guess, into circuit. And that trophy basically gave me the okay from the parents once they see, you know, typical Asian parents, they see, oh, my kid can beat the white man. So I get the full support. <laughs> So my first car was a 2009 R36 Passat. But saying that, how that led on to the Evo was um, after three months of getting me the car, my parents left back to Malaysia. I was all alone, student in Melbourne. It was sort of the wrong car to go circuit racing. It wasn't meant for the circuit, right? It was something else. So I sold it without my parents' knowledge. So the car at the time was about, I think, second hand back then, about 65,000 Aussie. And Evo 9s were only about 20 plus at the time. So with a difference of 40 grand, I basically had, I swapped it. I had 40 grand cash and an Evo 9. Basically leave 10 grand for competition tires and wheels and stuff like that, entrance fees. And we had 30 grand to make the car go fast and reliable. So that's what we did. We just dumped in like 30,000 Aussie into an Evo 9 to, you know, coilovers, handling bits. Uh, the basic go fast bits for the engine bay without attracting too much uh, attention from the cops because Australia, the laws are quite stringent with modifications. So yeah, basically that's how I was self-funded by selling the car without family approval. And when they got back, I picked them up and they're like, oh, wait to borrow your friend's car. I'm like, yeah, my friend's car. And when we got home, they quickly learned that, yeah, the car was sold and it's now this loud Japanese car. They got really angry, shouting at me on the lift all the way up, walked through the apartment and they suddenly stopped because they realized there was a few trophies there and they're like, you're not a sportsman, you're overweight. Where did these come from? I was like, oh, from driving? What do you mean? I'm like, oh, I do time attack, blah, blah, blah. And then that's the first time my parents heard that without any support, I just basically gave myself the opportunity and was rewarded straight away. And from then they saw that I had the, I don't know, skill set luck, whatever you want to call it. So they gathered support from that one trophy. So if I did not sell that first car of mine, I would not have been here for sure. My first year in racing Porsche Carrera Cup Asia, so that was 2013. When it came to the hardest, most deadly circuit on earth, Macau, it decided to rain. So that's why that trophy, when I went to Macau, was the most memorable. The 
first, second, third place cars, we were just aquaplaning in, in fifth gear. And honestly, how I did the overtake was I was ballsy or stupid, whatever you want to call it. I was the only guy who managed to pick sixth gear because everybody was afraid once they go into sixth gear because the car was already dancing. So the second you pick sixth gear, it's either it was going to be all right, the downforce is going to keep you down, or you're going to aquaplane and just smash the wall at about 260 kilometers an hour. Being 21 at the time, I didn't know any better. I pulled six and I just cut forward and then we went into the braking marker. So that could have really hurt, but somehow the risk uh, yeah, we were rewarded that day. It's somewhere outside, but there is a E60 525. It's been in the family since 2009, maybe. I guess it'll be the other two more special ones would be Blue Arrow, where without that car, there would not be Alif Hamdan like today. Also, this was the byproduct of selling that Volkswagen, right? Eventually led to this. Yeah, it's always a very special car to me, and uh, it's the longest car I've owned. I've never owned a car longer than Blue Arrow before. Yeah, another special mention, I guess, is a, a big thank you to my secret support system, I suppose. She's been with me since Evo Nationals, uh, 2000, what was it, 2010, 2009, first Evo Nationals, all the way to today. So that's, what, 13, no, 14 years already, with my uh, girlfriend at the time, now wife, and soon to be my baby mama, Fatin, <laughs> my wife as well. So pretty lucky in this uh, aspects that it is not as how you guys would, would probably think, you know, every dollar you spend to the car, you have to spend on me as type thing. Because let me tell you, man, if that was to happen, poof, there would not be a workshop. <laughs> yeah, so ever since day one, she's always had a liking for cars and I've never had to pull her to the circuit, she's always wanting to be there, that type of thing, so really lucky on that part. Well, it's going to be a boy, the name we're going to decide later on, I suppose, but yeah, I mean, if he's an academic, maybe we'll make a race engineer out of him. If he's not, then I guess we need somebody to change tires, don't we? <laughs> Obviously, driving is very important to me and people around me, so without a doubt, for sure, if he wants to take his license, in a saga, he has to be within three seconds of my lap time to even consider to learn how to drive a car, otherwise keep trying. That's my personal rule. My body is really spongy, so I put on and lose weight really quickly, so it's very hard for me to stay at some size. My weight at World Time Attack, I was 125 kilos, waist size 42. At the moment now, I've uh, gained a little weight as it's like off season, and I've been a bit lazy. Right now, I'm hovering at like 80, 85. So in just working out, it was almost 4,000 calories. So I used to have to eat a lot just to try to maintain 72. Otherwise, you quickly like, lose weight and lose muscle and get sick. So you look for every advantage that you can. And uh, I think I was 13, 14% body fat back then. I'm now well over 25, but yeah, back then it was like 12. You had to stay so hungry just to be competitive. Uh, your day was planned through training. You had to train that minimum five times a week at three times a day. In the end of the day, I would not have done anything differently because along the journey, I've learned to be better in things that I like, like how to make cars go fast, the experiences, the people that I've met. I could say that it all paid off in the end. It was really nice that I met such socially responsible people back then that's not just going to give any 19-year-old power and just say, yep, figure it out by yourself, mate. You know, they're not going to be like that type of way. So what I would like to change in Malaysia is, yes, there are a lot of uh, up-and-coming affluent families around. So kids these days at 18, their first car is some six, seven, eight hundred horsepower out of 35. Let me tell you, they don't know how to drive it. I don't know why. People in Malaysia, they seem to think that it's a good idea to learn how to control your car in Genting rather than Sepang, where it's safe, controlled environment. So come on guys, buy the car, go to Sepang, lose control, figure out where the limits are, and then when you're at Genting, just drive 20% less, there you stay. Then everybody can go out, have a good time, and not have a bad rap. Every lap costs a lot of money. So when you're out there discovering things for yourself, things that you learn in 100 laps with a professional racing driver next to you, you could probably get that done in 10. By doing 90 less laps learning the same thing, I'm sure it will be a lot feasible to you know, even tip your coach and still have money left over. So I guess the challenges that I'm facing uh, as a driver coach for people who come in and see me is uh, basically, I guess it's 
ego the biggest thing because everybody generally in the car scenes think pretty highly of their driving standards and capabilities. I mean, you can see that every weekend. I'm sure you can ask the tow truck boys, they'll know, they'll tell you. <laughs> My name is Alif Hamdan, that's my story, and thanks for watching. Never miss a goal. Watch it on BKA Live TV app right now.